Kia ora and welcome to the Niggly Nish cast. You are here listening to Mr. South Auckland Doostra, the Pabtai Panther, and we are here with the Wobbly Wildcard for another episode of the Nish cast. We are recording this on Thursday morning. Early in the week, we record the Nish Cage Variety Show, and we also have a Patreon episode on our Patreon page, which is all about Joseph Parker after his fight versus Derek Chisora. So check that out if you are a patron. It is live on the Patreon page. And if you're listening to this and you're reading some uh, decent Kiwi sports yarns via the Niche Case, you like them, you're tuning in to the Substack email as well, and you want to support the Niche Case, jump on Patreon. That is the best way to support the Niche Case. And you can read about sports at theniche-case.com. You can read about sports and whatever else floats our boat on our emails which come out Monday and Friday sign up just hit the link on our Facebook or Twitter page wobbly wildcard can you open the lid of your compost bin of mindfulness and uh, share what you find in there that I certainly can this one comes courtesy of um, of the guru Sharon Salzberg who is someone I am actually familiar with from um, repeated uh, appearances on Duncan Trussell's podcast. Um, she says, mindfulness isn't difficult. We just need to remember to do it. I think that kind of, um, that kind of little jumpstart kind of uh, wisdom is always an important one to keep in mind as well. We can go very big picture when it comes to some of the ideas, but also there's also the very small picture of like the mundane. You just have to remember to actually commit to things to be able to like, get the benefits and especially mindfulness because when you realize that you should do it then you're aware of your actions and your thoughts more um more importantly your thoughts which is the whole thing here is you got to do it and then it brings you back to mindfulness you're in a mindfulness space because otherwise you can get swept around with uh, all sp- all sorts of jibber jabber indeed and i find just the I find, like, the discipline of saying I'm going to meditate for 15 minutes each day. It doesn't matter when or how or whatever. I'm just going to at least find a 15-minute window during every day um, to to do this thing. I find, like, that is also, like, the biggest hurdle to getting something out of that is just the commitment. You know what I mean? Like, just the actual, the remembering to do it is not I don't know, uh, I was going to say not as important as the act itself, but maybe it is, I don't know, maybe, maybe like just actually committing to doing something, having that discipline is at least as beneficial because it's the first step and the rest of the stuff doesn't happen unless you do that first. And a slither of that process is catching yourself and just coming back to a mindful state with your thoughts. That's disciplined as well. You've got to be disciplined to catch your thoughts and bring it back and then graduate to your meditation practice. It's all about um, awareness and intentionality, I think, this this particular quote. Mindfulness isn't difficult. We just need to remember to do it. Kawabunga. I am going to present a an idea to you, Wildcard, and, and to our listeners. It's not... I don't necessarily... I'm not really looking for feedback because I'm still trying to figure it out myself. And I don't, like, I'm just in the stage where I'm just throwing it out for people to simmer over the weekend um, and just, just put it out there. I'm, we're, at, we're covering Kiwi Sports here at the Niche Cage. We've got record Kiwi NRL numbers. You can follow the tweets. You can follow the yarns with any of this stuff. I don't need to list out evidence. Like, it's all over the Niche Cage, this stuff. We are dealing in record black caps and kiwi cricket situations we are dealing in record kiwis in the nba we're dealing in record kiwi woman in the ncaa we're dealing in record numbers of kiwis in the a league and the w league and the ambl and the premier league football woman football doing amazing things we are dealing in record kiwi sporting expansion why would you invest in New Zealand rugby if we are dealing in record Kiwi expansion and this expansion, to some extent, I believe this has already happened and I believe we're in the midst of it. It's not 
detrimental to rugby it's just the numbers are evening out across the across the board and i think we're coming into a space where new zealand sports is far more spread across the different sports and the genders as well you can be a the options for women are far more greater than they used to be the options for men are far more greater than they used to be than just rugby and netball so if this is the case my idea is that i don't see new zealand rugby as a good money-making investment does that resonate with you in any way just a quick check yeah i mean it it does um my feelings on the matter hadn't even gone as far as that because you make a you make a fair point but also um especially when you're looking at like new zealand's a relatively closed market if you if you think about it like it's a country of about five million people there's not that much room for growth i would have thought in terms of um in terms of the rugby union in general i mean it's bloody it's not even being upkept as it is like part of the reason that deal got push through um the way it did is because everyone's desperate for money and they're willing to like effectively sacrifice an eighth of control of the thing and i just i can't stand the um i haven't even thought about the the potential of the investment i've just been thinking about how bad it is from a precedent standpoint like a, a moral standpoint of some things just shouldn't be for sale, and I think you you walk in a slippery slope, and there's a, enough money coming in that I understand why everyone's effectively been bought off. Um, I am very skeptical that that money can be invested sustainably within the the game from grassroots upwards to the top, um, when there's as much stuff that probably has been ignored for as long as it has been. Um, I mean, they're only just now talking about getting a, a women's super rugby thing going. Like, that's a, a good example. And then even they, I mean, to be to be honest, like, they kind of used things like easy that. Easy on, Wildcard. Easy on, easy on, easy on. Don't go too deep. Probably down don't need to go too deep, I'm, no. You, but you can... I will just say that one point is they did kind of, like, use the women's rugby and grassroots as like this is what we can do to fix it it's like yeah fix the problems that new zealand rugby caused by under investing in these things for so long like these as these crucial aspects of the sport and now it's like the the bargaining chip to sell out a large percentage of the the yeah i mean you've done the once they've done this once i just wonder like what's to stop them from selling some more later on like it's a uh, it's a very slippery slope in my mind but there's a reason we don't talk too much about rugby here. Exactly. We've all got we've all got different um ethical and moral standings from a strictly business perspective, where we all have different business leanings as well, financial leanings. I'm just curious as an investment, I'm everyone out there, you yeah, ponder your ethical and moral situations and maybe like phew, haven't exactly seen the English football reaction in the New Zealand rugby context which in itself could be viewed as interesting but if you're investing money and you're watching all these other sports grow and rugby plateau will you make a significant or decent return on your investment i don't know it's a just interesting stuff to ponder here wildcard you have been meditating on joseph park we did like a monday reaction you've you've been through the process of simmering it letting it come to a boil a fruition what if what have you what's a conclusion that you can hit us with later on in the week after joseph parker's went over derek chisora yeah rewatched the fight of tried to keep up with a lot of the the post-match reaction although there wasn't really a whole lot of that um i think everything that needed to be said about the fight was said within about 30 minutes of it finishing and then after that there's just been regurgitating the same stuff so not a whole lot there but i'd like to think i added something to the um to the conversation with the words that i wrote on the fight i i mean we talked about the fight itself um i didn't change on the on the patreon podcast i didn't really change too much in my opinions on that matter i thought maybe the first round had been a little closer than it actually was and um in in hindsight watching it back like nudges or actually I, I thought maybe Parker had like done enough over the back half of that round to maybe push a, a like a drawn round, but um, even with the knockdown. But now nah, that just was not the case. However, I think that like he was closer in round two, and then definitely like round sort of six, I think was about where it swung. 
um, where Chizora, round six, Chizora still threw a lot of punches, but he didn't, like, it was the last round where that was the case, and it was the first round where you could see Parker starting to get his wind up, and, like, the differences in fitness became obvious at that point, and then from, yeah, seventh onwards, Chizora's um, just, just, like, quantity of overall, not talking successful punches or anything, but just the amount of punches he was thrown full stop, dropped, like, fell off a cliff. Like, it dropped significantly as clearly his arms were tiring and his head stopped moving and, you know, um, he's gasping for air in the, um, in his corner in between rounds and whatnot. And Parker was able to probably run the gauntlet the rest of the way, arguably won all six of the, um, rest of the rounds. Maybe, I think there was round 10 was very close. A lot of people said round 12, like I've seen quite a few instances of people saying Chizora won 12 and watching it back, I, uh, shocked by like, I, did, I just don't see it I, 12 was a comprehensive Parker um, round in, in my eyes but um, overall like yeah so I watching it back don't disagree with the with the um, result I think Parker did win a close fight there that's all sweet as um, the big lesson I took from it is I just think I think maybe Joseph Parker has a little bit of an identity crisis going on because we've talked a lot about um, or everyone has talked a lot about Joseph Parker's knockout potential, and it's sort of accepted that he's just not that guy. I mean, it, it shouldn't be sort of accepted. It should be straight up accepted. Joseph Parker does not knock out the best opponents. He beats them on points, or he loses on points. Like, that's the way it has gone with every sort of... Um, like, there's... I'm pretty sure we... I'm pretty sure I might have even said this on the podcast. Like, you can draw a line in the sand. If you rank all his opponents in terms of quality, you can draw a line in the sand... Um, at one clear point, which is like the knockout line. Below this line, he knocks everyone out. Above this line, he doesn't knock them out. Um, and it's purely based on the quality of opponents. So, like, we're talking about him trying to get to a title challenge. He's not going to be a knockout artist. I just wonder if he fully... I think he knows that, but I don't know if he's fully embraced that because there were a lot of instances in the Chizora fight where, like, if you're going to be the fighter who wins on the cards... There's certain things you got to do in order to like give yourself the best opportunity of that. One is not to get knocked down after seven seconds. Like that's just a terrible way to start any fight. Um, it was inconsequential as far as the rest of the fight went, but it wasn't inconsequential for the result because that's a point off his um, standing, a uh, point off his scorecard in a very close fight. So um, that could have been crippling to him. Um, one mistake, seven seconds in, like could have been the losing of the fight for him. Other things, though, that are more notable throughout the thing, like he wasn't quite wrapping Chisora up in the clinch and he was getting hit in the ribs quite a lot and the little, like, Chisora's free right hand just tapping at him. Like, not not painful punches, but kind of punches where, you know, if a judge is seeing that as something worth scoring, then you're in trouble because you've given up points there. Um, there's, all, like, just in general, I thought, in the first half of the fight, he didn't throw nearly enough. Like, it's... Chizora was he was coming out um he's coming out all guns blazing letting his hands fly and it was definitely Parker's intention to wear Chizora out and then run him down in the back half but he still could have done a lot more to protect himself and maybe win one or two of those earlier rounds um either a little easier or just at all if he'd just like let his hands go a little bit more and um throwing a few more counter punches and just not let himself get backed into court like i just thought in general he he held himself back too much and if you're trying to win a fight on the cards um which it has to be the intention for parker every time he goes out to fight because against best opponents as i've just said like that is that is the avenue to victory for him uh, i just thought he could have been smarter in a lot of those areas however it was the first um oh i not to not to um, gloss over as well, that moment in the 12th round where he had him on the ropes and he just stood there and watched him. Like, he, he could have gone in for the kill and really, like, pounce, get a, a knockdown that would cancel out the one from earlier in the fight and pretty much um, put him in, like, the box seat for victory rather than having to sweat out a close decision, not knowing if your arm's going to be lifted up with the other guys. Like... He he could have he could have just been so much more ruthless in that moment, and he wasn't, which was also disappointing. And I think these little aspects of the, of um, the way he fought that were were yeah frustrating because it went against the way that he should have been trying to win. Um, having said that, he still won, and overall it was a pretty impressive performance and one of the best. Probably, well, it's at least the sixth result now on his um, on his career record. 
Andy Ruiz maybe still pips it. Um, I think maybe this was a better performance than the Andy Ruiz one. It's just there it was there were a couple of obvious ways where he could have done better, and I just wonder if this is like Joseph Parker getting caught up in the chat um, about you know people wanting to see knockouts and all these kind of things. He's not that kind of fighter, and I think he just needs to embrace more to the fullest extent to embrace that he's not that fighter and he knows how he's going to win fights and it's by doing other things and yeah not cutting corners in those areas and just being clinical and being ruthless when the moment comes around but not being reckless it's something to look for as he um continues his partnership with andy lee as trainer i think probably is is the way to look at it beauty and you wrote about all of that and that's live on the website that you can check out correct Certainly is three thousand words on um, Joseph Parker versus Derek Chisora, which is sort of two like sort of two articles split into not split but combined into one. It's kind of like the fight recap and then the aftermatch, um, after aftermath reaction. I just chucked them all together in one article, so there we go. Beauty, beauty. Do you have any memory of what I've said about the Gold Coast Titans over the last six months? Um, uh, it's, no, but as soon as you say it, I'm sure it's like light bulbs are going to go off in my head. I'm going to be like, ah, oh, that's right. That's what he said. But on, on the spot now, I can't, I can't remember what I had for breakfast, let alone what we've talked about in other podcasts. So I'll raise the presence of Ezra Howe as the recruitment. Oh, yeah, they got the light bulbs. <laughs> Who is the recruitment? What is he? You can anyone can check out his LinkedIn profile. He's the Gold Coast Titans recruitment manager. Uh, funnily enough, I, this is purely coincidental. He went to Northland College, which Paul Turner. He's from Northland. Now I don't think that played a role in Paul Turner going to the Gold Coast Titans. I'm just holding back writing about this because the Titans, at the time of recording, hadn't made it official, but. We basically have it's a few other news outlets have reported that it's um, that Paul Turner is going to go to the Gold Coast Titans next year. He is off contract with the Warriors, and from a Warriors perspective, they've got center kind of sorted. They've got they've got fullback and the halves kind of sorted, and it would have been nice to keep Paul Turner, especially now that we're seeing Paul Turner and Hayes Perham leave the Warriors, so it is a bit of a bummer to see them go, but, I mean, other players are filling the void, so it's professional footy at the end of the day, and when you put these dots together, obviously Paul Turner is going to go to the Gold Coast Titans because his brother Lee Turner is playing at centre for the Tweed Heads reserve grade team, so the Gold Coast Titans, one of their reserve grade teams is Lee Tur- is Tweed Heads, where Lee Turner's playing center. He is the older brother, I think, of Paul Turner. And the Gold Coast Titans probably have more openings, you know, maybe a half spot for Paul Turner if he wants it, um, or center, whatever it is. So I think it makes complete sense for Paul Turner to go, go to the Gold Coast Titans when his brother is already loosely in the Titans system and there is a better playing opportunity for Paul Turner at the Titans. Then you factor in Ezra Howe, because we also have Isan Masters has joined the Titans mid-season, and he's a former, you know, decorated um, Kiwi, junior Kiwi. He did play junior Kiwis, but he's like a decorated junior at the junior Kiwis level, and he has definitely worked with Ezra Howe in some capacity. So Ezra Howe, over the last like year or two, he's bought Sam Lasoni and Aaron Clark from New Zealand. And he worked with them. Sam Lasoni was a bit earlier, so I don't know if he did work with them when he was an assistant coach of the Junior Kiwis. But uh, Ezra Howe has definitely worked with Aaron Clark in the Junior Kiwis, so he brought them across. Then he brings Patrick Herbert, who he worked with at the Junior Kiwis. He got where he went to the Titans. Now we're seeing Paul Turner's likely to go to the Titans. Again, Paul Turner starting halfback in the 2019 Junior Kiwis. Ezra Howe was the coach of that team. 
and we've also got Isan Masters making a mid-season move. So Ezra Howe is pulling the strings of recruitment at the Gold Coast Titans, and there is a pretty obvious trend of him recruiting Kiwi NRL players who he has a connection with through the New Zealand Rugby League coaching pathway. On top of that, the Gold Coast Titans, and this is what I'm this is all the stuff I'm gonna write about when the Titans make Paul Turner official if they do, because the Titans are probably one of the busier clubs recruiting out of Aotearoa at the moment, again, under Ezra Howe. Um, they had Dean Mariner. He went from Auckland to playing in the under-18 final. He won the under-18 final playing for Tweed Heads. He's a centre. You've got Sam McIntyre, TJ Devery, and Vaka Sikahele. They played in the under-18 schools versus clubs game last year. They all are in the Titans system. It's basically southeastern Queensland is just massive for recruiting out of Aotearoa right now. It's happening at the junior level with the Titans, and also they're bolstering their NRL stock. So if you're looking for a bit of Kiwi NRL funk, support the Titans because they're massive recruiters out of Aotearoa, as a lot of clubs are, to be honest, and also... Um, they got some nice talent coming through. Patrick Herbert, Isam Masters needs to get back into the NRL. That's another thing here. Aaron Clark went on a train and trial deal, and there's a vibe of like targeting players who are looking for an opportunity. Sam Lasani needed a bit of a resurgence in his career. Titans get him. Isam Masters, same thing. Patrick Herbert coming into his prime, they get him. Paul Turner coming into his prime is early NRL days, get him. So just something I'm noticing with the Gold Coast Titans and their Kiwi NRL recruitment, pay attention to Ezra Howe because he's running the show. Kia kaha. There we go. It's always um, it's always funky how you get these little like pockets and storylines and, and things like this, and it often just does come down to like one or two people's influence sometimes. It's It's funny how that goes, and it's also been a little bit funny how the titans season has gone because i watched that game um last week against the broncos where they were what was it like 22 nil up after about 25 minutes and it was like well this is gonna this this is enjoyable broncos are getting absolutely munted here and then next thing bloody broncos come all the way back when it uh where are we 36 28 which means the titans have lost three games in a row all by double figures uh no 28 is only eight. by at least eight points um they were supposed to be really good this year was what a lot of people were saying and um maybe uh, i think it's another one of those ones where you can't really be a dominant nrl team if you don't have um a dominant halves pairing you kind of need that like that's where you get the control for your game from um, don't really see any teams uh, above them on the ladder who don't have that. The Warriors are actually one position above that, so maybe that's where the, the line gets drawn off. Um, which, talking about Paul Turner, should that one come along, well, you know, maybe might get a a decent run um, early on next season if he if he does indeed end up there. Like, there's... I guess that's what you're saying about giving opportunities to um, to players who need opportunities is that if you can offer those, uh, it generally means your team isn't doing the best that they could be doing. But this is one way to get a lot better is actually exactly what people have been saying about Otago Cricket lately, isn't it? Where, like, are you developing the best players in the country in this region? No, but you have an opportunity that other... Uh, or you have a... An, out, an avenue to get in talent in your team that others don't have, which is like the potential of free spots in your starting 11, which, yeah, if you can, um, someone like, uh, Dale Phillips is probably a good example of recent times who's been like, well, I could play Auckland A's or I could go play first class for Otago and develop my cricket that way. And yeah, it's a little bit of a no-brainer if you're in that situation. I guess that's exactly what we're talking about with um, a lot of these Kiwi NRL guys who are going over there to the Titans as well. Well, salary cap is a huge thing there because the Titans, obviously, like, uh, like it's, it, I'm not a huge fan of like a lot of the NRL, like how what we're what we're told is the main thing when it's not the main thing. Like the Titans just signed a couple forwards. 
they didn't necessarily sign the players who genuinely win you games and competitions. But in, but so that just means like, I don't it didn't really take them as like premiership favorites seriously at the start of the season but you can see that they are on the right pathway to stepping into that upper realm in the coming years and that's based on big signings lots of money so how do you fill out your squad and get good value from your cheaper players so that's where the opportunity bit comes in because it's like we need reasonably cheap players to contribute to the nrl and probably outperform their contract value because put the the warriors spin it was like so much it was definite spin like they came out on the front foot and like we we offered paul turner this amount of money um but he didn't want it and he's taken up a lesser a different offer which many people thought was less so paul turner he's not going there for the money He's going there for the opportunity. And, you know, I think there's some serious links with his brother and maybe a family is based there or whatever it is. So it's beneficial to him personally. But the Titans are getting value and they want Paul Turner to outperform that value. Just like they signed Patrick Herbert. They didn't go out and get a big money player. They just signed Patrick Herbert. They signed Isan Masters, who has barely played NRL this year. So what's his... I don't like you're not going to pay a lot of money for him so i think the titans are just, just trying to plug their holes around the big money signings with better players with more skillful um dynamic players that suit the nrl right now which they might be doing um we've got sea eagles versus warriors and we've got dragons versus bulldogs we'll keep it in our niche cage derby lens here Dragons, not a big Kiwi NRL team. They are probably the worst Kiwi NRL team in the NRL. That's NRL factor and junior pathway factor. They do have Pawasa Fatamasili starting, uh, coming off the bench for this game. Um, you're playing against the lowly Bulldogs. Sunday Arvo, just quickly here, wildcard, how are you feeling? A couple losses, then you get the Bulldogs. I'm not confident for the Dragons, but I guess you might be uh, I, I don't know i wouldn't say that after the way they've played the last few rounds they're not a fantastic um i don't know it's tricky because they they came out looking excellent um in the first few rounds and you sort of didn't expect this um this level of play from the dragons where they were just like dotting every i and crossing every t and doing everything like quickly to a high standard and um nothing too flashy although there was a sort of a, a quite a lot more um offloads and looking to switch the ball a little uh, switch the play a little bit more than they have been um in the last couple of seasons which i guess just comes down to confidence when you're playing well and not making mistakes you feel like you can try some of these things um then that quickly dried up and now they're looking like the team that i thought they would be coming into the season so it's uh, it's very much like do I trust that? Do I trust in the team that I saw in the first few rounds, um, first sort of five weeks or so? Do I trust in that being the closer to the reality? Because obviously the reality is somewhere in between. They were never going to keep winning games at like a Panthers um, like level of um, success. The way I mean, Penrith is still undefeated, aren't they? Like. Um, the Dragons weren't going to do that. They weren't going to just keep winning games like that. And they have been, even through the um, through through the McGregor years, they were a team that would go on streaks like this. They'd start really flash and then they'd fade in the second half of the season or, you know, the big win streak followed by a big losing streak. Um, this isn't out of character for this club. So, like, the reality was going to be somewhere in between what we've seen the last few weeks and what we saw in the first few weeks. It's just that which one of those, like, which will they be closer to which side of those? And I unfortunately am probably a little more pessimistic in thinking that they might be closer to the team that they've been the last few weeks. Cause that is after all what I thought they would be coming into the season where I thought, you know, if they just don't get wooden spoon, I'll be not happy, but I, I at least won't riot. Um, now, Maybe they're starting to look like that again, which is the worry. But the, like on the one hand, the Bulldogs are exactly the kind of team you want to play, a team that's similarly low on confidence, 
um, absolutely terrible. I'm looking at that, one and seven through their first eight games with a minus 168 points difference. They're the only team with points difference worse than minus 100, and it's minus 168. So they're by far the worst team um, in the competition. However, the Dragons are the type of team that allows the worst teams to get into a rhythm and um, at least have a competitive game against them. So, yeah, I, I don't really know what to expect, to be honest. Where did they play last week? Was that also at the Jubilee Stadium against the Tigers? It was at, yeah, Wynn Stadium. So, in Wollongong. So the ground that they share with the Wellington Phoenix, I I think. Yes, the the red memory. Wellington Phoenix, the red and white Wellington. Yeah, Wellington yeah, Phoenix. that's the one. Um, the Dragons losing that game to the Tigers, not quite Tigers losing to the Cowboys when just after the Tommy Radonikus passing, but fairly shitty performance for the home fans, losing to the Tigers. Like the Dragons have that stuff in them. And a home game against the Bulldogs sounds like a recipe for one of those games. The earlier game on a Sunday, going to be a fun Sunday, Arvo, for you, I guess, because no one really is going to care about the Dragons versus Bulldogs otherwise. Um, the, yeah, just me. The Warriors <laughs> versus me. Manly. Tom Trebojevic is playing for Manly. Um, Warriors... No real massive changes other than Chanel Harris-Tavita is coming back. You asked me about this on the Variety Show, and I'm so just wait and see. I like no idea what how this plays out. Um, you know, I, at some stage in my life, I thought the Warriors shouldn't let Hayes Perham or Paul Turner go. So, like <laughs> looking into the future is pretty weird with this stuff because I also didn't know Reese Walsh was just going to appear on the Warriors' lap. Um, you're going to have a great battle of, of the centers here. Uh, who's been playing on the right? So you've got Rocco Berry versus Morgan... No, you're going to have Adam Pompey versus Morgan Harper. Morgan Harper's been playing really well. He is from Narawahia in the Waikato. The Bulldogs recruited him from Narawahia. Where he was playing like Premier Men's footy as like a 15-year-old. And then... He didn't get too many opportunities at the Bulldogs. Went to Manly last year. He won his like first three games with Manly. Or he scored a try in the first three games. Something like that last year. And now he, he didn't start the season at centre for the Seagulls. But he's set himself up there. And he is very good. So him coming up, up against Adam Pompey is like a Kiwi centre battle. Um, because the Kiwis will need another centre. With Joseph Manu on one edge. And then you'll have like... Rocco Berry, Adam Pompey, Morgan Harper competing, especially now that Sean's Nickel Clockstad's out injured and Issa Masters is um, not quite as good anymore. So that's interesting. Another game of Rocco Berry is pretty interesting. I, like, I'm going to put out their wild card. Rocco Berry undercover Matt Burden style. Yeah, all right. I... I'll, I'll take that one on board. Similar, similar smooth, criminal, I guess, style. Yeah, to tall, pakia, skillful, tough enough. Comes into the center, commands selection in future games. Not too bad. Do you have any gut feel on Harris Tavita? Is he going to play? Well, I, I did like check for um before i ask you the question on the variety show which i guess is ex even more relevant at this point um i did like just check to see if there was injury updates or whatever on like and i didn't realize he was coming back so soon it seemed like he would probably be a couple of weeks away like not long which is why there was the impetus for the question but um this very week was maybe a little bit of a surprise so i i don't know it's just Sometimes you just chuck a little curveball in the lineup to get teams thinking one way, and then you switch things up. What did they actually do? They named him and Walsh, eh? and Nikarima was going to play dummy half or off the bench, or what? What was the situation? I haven't got it in front of me. For this week's team, yeah. Uh, what did they actually like name? Harris Tavita might not even play. He's on the extended bench, so right. There's there's no reason to rush. Okay, him. so it's a mix-up thing. Yeah. yeah. 
I think because a lot of the stuff the Warriors, uh, they've, you know, I, I talked shit about it before how they put the spin on the Paul Turner delivery. They, that is part of being very good at getting in front and transparent with things. There was a there's a situation with Adam, uh, David Fusatua, um, mixed reports, so I don't really want to comment on it. But the Warriors came out very quickly and made their perception clear, and that's just something the Warriors are doing. And I I see I use the word transparent, but they're being transparent about Reese Walsh and the realities of trying to fit all these dudes into the same team. But I think that is part of a non-transparent smokescreen around Reese Walsh to maintain calm, you know, like you like they're just they're just playing this very smartly is is what I'm observing. Yeah, I do I agree with that. It's one of those like you sort of have to be it's tricky because you have to be careful and decisive at the same time. You can't look like the team's being taken for a ride with um the way things play out in any of these kind of media situations like so you do need to get out on the front foot more often than not i think that's a pretty like the best um the best teams worldwide the best sports teams at at um doing this kind of thing they know how to control the narrative in that kind of way but also you have to not be aggressive or a dick about it or those kind of like it's it's a difficult balance and um i think like to to drop a, a personal anecdote of my own on this, like I think someone who's extremely good at this is is Ole Gunnar Solskjaer at Manchester United. I think he's had a lot of situations where he's had to be very balanced about what he says without like trying to say stuff without looking like you're dodging a question or um so like they've got a situation where they've got um David De Gea who's been the first team goalkeeper for a decade and he's one of the best goalkeepers the team's ever had. A little bit of um, poor form in the last couple of seasons, though. Young guy coming through, Dean Henderson. He's already in England international. Um, fantastic goalkeeper. He started, like, so, at some point there was a little flip where De Gea was unavailable. Henderson comes in, starts starting games then um, in the Premier League. And now Henderson seems to be the starting goalkeeper in Premier League football the rest of the way. But he's not admitting, like, they were saying, is Henderson now your number one? And he's, he'll say things like, no, they're both number one. And... Um, trying to keep Henderson happy when he wasn't playing at all, and now trying to keep De Gea happy when he isn't playing as much. But um, yeah, that's they're, they're very and he, he'll he's one who'll throw out those smoke screens as well. I remember there was a game against Chelsea earlier in the season where Scott McTominay had a had a little bit of an injury, and McTominay's like the um, the battering ram midfielder that always plays in these big games for his energy and whatnot. And they asked him if he was going to be fit to play. And Solskjaer says, like, the day before the game, no, 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 it's going to take a miracle at this point. Um, we're hopeful that he'll recover. But, yeah, it'll be a miracle if he's actually able to play. Next thing you know, he's named in the starting team, plays 90 minutes, no dramas. Like, these kind of little things. It's all part of the game, isn't it? Like, it's all part of just, um, it's all part of uh, professional sports in a, in a social media era, I suppose, is you do need to be quite... Um, you need to be quite decisive, as I say. You need to be careful. You need to be diplomatic. Um, but it also, if you can do those things, it actually does give you a little bit of room to be a little bit of a sneaky bugger as well. I expect the Harris Tavita thing is just a matter of... Um, if you name him on the extended bench, then you can pick him later on, can't you? Like, it's a... Um, if, you, if he's not on the extended bench, and I don't think you can bring him into the team if you decide that he passes a fitness test later in the week or something or whatever. I suspect it's one of those things, but it is a... You know, you leave your options open, don't you? I I think it's like, so all the stuff you said about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, unless like they, they are renowned for having leaks within their organization, I think in any sports, the best case scenario is that you know the players, coaching staff, they know what is going to happen when the game transpires. Then publicly and outwardly you present a completely different case so the people who don't know in this instance how the Warriors are going to line up are the Manly Seagulls and the general public so within the Warriors they know what they're going to do and I think unless it's an absolute shit show which no reason why it is and any other like sporting good sporting culture good sporting teams when this happens everyone in-house knows what it, what is going to happen when you take the field so if Chanel Harris-Tavita is coming straight back into the halves, Reese Walsh has been told 
Chanel Harris DeVita has been told, and that's how it is. If he's not going to play this week, they've got their plan, and they can present whatever they want to the media who just play along. Um, yeah, in all those cases, within house, you definitely want clarity and transparency with what you're doing. So the no, if you're a player, you want to best prepare um, combinations, all that stuff. So the Warriors, Manly Warriors, lost the game, a tough game to Manly earlier in the year, a couple of weeks ago, to be honest. Um, and now Tom Trebojevic comes back, but the Warriors have improved a bit as well. No Marty Tapao and no Josh Alawai. So that's interesting as well. Good game for the Warriors to come up the guts then. Straight down the middle, give it to some pizzazz out wide as it usually goes. Radio wildcard. We've got a... Today I wrote about the Black Caps and just covering the bases with the Black Caps now that the IPL has been postponed. Um, shout out to the world, shout out to people, shout out to India and anyone else who's going through shit. Um, from a Black Caps perspective, getting players to England now who are in the Test squad, beneficial. Because the IPL final was like a couple days before that first test versus England. Now, those players who are in the test squad in the IPL. Um, who is it? Let me bring it up here. You've got Williamson, Bolt, Jamison, Santner. Um, they are in the test squad to face England. They can just go straight to England. So, it's kind of worked out. A couple of weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, we were talking about just the uncertainty. Anything could happen between now and the World Test Championship final. Shit has happened. Um, to this extent, or to this moment, for strictly the Black Caps players preparing for the World Test Championship, it's kind of a good thing that they can just go straight to England. Uh, Will Young has been playing with Durham. His stint, I think, is over. And that is where things sit ahead of the Test Series wildcard. Do you have any kind of thoughts or jumping off points from that? Well, I just got a notification on my phone saying that, um, what do you call them? The Black Caps players, uh, where are we? New Zealand cricketers in COVID-19 ravaged India will be able to get out of the country on a charter flight tomorrow after the Indian Premier League was postponed. Um, but it's one of those more to come things. So I don't know if that means a charter flight to New Zealand or a charter flight to England. Because the trick here is that some players are going in one direction and others are going in the other direction, aren't they? Like, um, if you're, as you say, part of the test squad, you're going to England. You're not going to come to New Zealand, do some quarantining, go to England, do some more quarantining or whatever. Like, you're not, it's just a waste of time. You go straight to England. You are going to be away from home during this time anyway. You were going to go straight from IPL to England. Um, there is. From what I understand, there's some slipperiness in terms of getting into England. Like it's, I, I heard on the radio this morning, you can't actually get there before next Tuesday or something. If you're, um, all the English players from the IPL have already gone back because they're citizens. But if you're not a British citizen, then um, that is the difficulty that you face. Um, I don't. I mean, this is all logistical stuff, though, isn't it? Which will be one way or another taken care of. And like, I don't think we need to worry that players won't make it to, like the the entire 20 man test squad is going to be in england in time um some of them it seems are going to be in there a little earlier than expected but that's probably yeah a good thing they get some extra preparation and whatever um i'm reminded of this story that i told on the variety show on monday about uh carl jemison and Virat Kohli. Virat Kohli apparently begging at him to to bowl at him with a juke ball in the net so he can get some reps in that way and Jamison doing his patriotic duty and refusing to do so. Um, all, I mean, all these little tweaks, it's it's like, it's logistical stuff that will ultimately be taken care of and we don't, we can, like, it's interesting to see how it goes and how pe what decisions are made and how people will travel and um, what the various happenings will be, but Ultimately, I don't think we have to worry whatsoever that the guys won't be there. In fact, it might, because we were facing a situation, weren't we, where if teams made, like if certain players made the very latter stages of the IPL, they then um, 
would not be available for the first test, uh, the Lord's test against England. I would imagine now that's not going to be the case. So that's probably one of the major factors to consider from this is that if we were going to see a rotated team in that first test, it might still, like it might still be things saying effectively we've got a three test series, two against England and then one against India. It's all within a month of each other. Maybe someone like Rachim Ravindra gets an opportunity as a bolter just in that first test and not beyond, but um, I'd say that looks less likely now. I think we can probably trust that we can pick our best team for those games and give people opportunities to play themselves into form and get back used to playing with red balls rather than white ones and all those kind of things. The Duke ball as well, the old Dukey, um, as Virat Kohli well knows, is a is a different element to the to the thing and that's something the black cats will have with two tests um leading into the world test championship finals all these things are are interesting ultimately i don't know how much effect they have on the black caps's um winter tour though however i think it's all sort of the same as it ever was it's just like to this point it's kind of uh, the stars have aligned in benji marshall fashion for the Black Caps just to get to the World Test Championship final. Like certain uh, events had to take place and little moments like sliding doors moments and all that good stuff had to happen for the Black Caps to get to the World Test Championship final. And the way things have played out, it kind of feels like that's continuing. That, like, that amplified over the last few days because get out of India, get to England and just... Yeah, just acquaint yourself, as you were saying. Uh, Will Young, his stint with Durham was up until April 25th. So he's just cruising. I don't know what he's up to. Like, he must just be cruising around England because, like, I'd, you know, I'm not sure about England's COVID public situation, but he's done with Durham. And, yeah, we'll have some friends soon. Like, a couple, whether it was on a variety show or the niche cast, I'm not sure. But I did ask you who would like finish this phase better will young who went who was the only kiwi to who has been playing county cricket in england or kyle jamison who was at bangalore in the ipl bit of a at the mo at the time or good good question now it's kind of null and void because yeah will young he hit a century so three games one century that's the, that's that's fine if we're preparing for a test series. Like that's all good. That's what we want from Will Young. He's in England. He's already scored a century against the Duke Ball. Blah blah blah. Cole Jamison. Shout out to Cole Jamison. He he delivered in the IPL. I'll pull up some uh, some stats here, wildcard, just to to bolster the situation. I think I had Jamison as the third best foreign seamer. He had nine wickets and an average of 24 RPO, nine, which is a bit high, but all good. Um, only Chris Morris from South Africa and Sam Curran were foreign seamers with more wickets than Kyle Jamison. And, you know, there were, how many we have here? 14 bowlers who took eight wickets or more. Jamison's one, Trent Bolt's one. And then the seamers we're dealing with strictly international cricketers. Mohamed Shami for India, Kagisio Rabada for South Africa, Mustafiza Rahman from Bangladesh, Pat Cummins, and then Curran and Morris up top as well. So shout out to Kyle Jamison. He delivered. He delivered on his price tag. He delivered on the expectations. He delivered on performing for Bangalore in a... And it's beneficial to him, obviously, being around it. But just after that Australian series and then the big price tag, it was a bit like, what's going to happen here? But he delivered. And that's good for him. And, like, granted, Jamison's work is probably better than what Will Young did. But in the context of coming into this England test cricket phase, they're both coming in with the same um, confidence and pizzazz. Yeah, you'd almost say first equal, eh, in terms of who... I think it was a variety show, that question was. And, like, I mean, you can make a case for Will Young because of the formats. You can make a case for Jamison because of the sort of... Um, uh, the, the higher pressure situation that he was under and this, the 
like lack of 2020 form he showed for the Black Caps over the summer. And I agree. I thought he's fantastic in the IPL. Like he didn't get that kind of. Um, it's 2020. You know, you only get four overs maximum in a in a game. Um, it's hard. Like if if to get a low average, you just need to have that one game where you take like four for 22 or something like that. Um, he didn't get that game. I don't think he ever took more than two wickets in a game, did he? But he he took at least one wicket. Most, if not all of his, I can't remember exactly, but every time I checked, I just remember seeing Jamison would have something like one for 28 or, or whatever. Um, there were a couple of big overs against him, like he got caught once or twice, um, but he consistently picked up at least a wicket, and that if you're doing that and not getting smashed overall, um, there's one thing, everyone gets the odd over that goes for heaps, but it's it's being able to respond the next over and only going for like six to eight or something like that the next time or getting that big wicket, which um, there's, there was one over I watched where he got, was taken for 20 by like, what have you been like Prithvi Shaw or someone like that. And the what like the first over that he bowled in a game, but then he got the dude out and like the fifth or sixth ball of the over. So like, that's the way to do it. That's the best way to respond, take care of the threat right there. And then, um, so yeah, Jamison was fantastic in that. And, I think mean, it's an interesting point about Trent Bolt too, because that's two seasons in a row where he's been really, really pretty handy in the IPL. Um, I don't know that we've seen that twenty twenty form from him for New Zealand either in recent years, and at, you know times in the past for sure. Um, often it's just the case with Bolt is he just doesn't play a lot of twenty twenties. I think he's played less than half of the games we've played since the last twenty twenty World T twenty. Um, that might. That might not be the case. Uh, that was a little bit. Of, that was definitely the case at one point when I wrote an article about it, um, and it's passed since then. So it might not be fully up to date, but it's still a impression that you get of Trent Bolt. He hasn't always been available for those games, or that's those are the ones where he's been rested. He's a guy with a heavy workload for sure, um, an all format player. So I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the difference like, because he's. I know he bowls with Brett Boomer on his team for, in the IPL, so that helps enormously. If you're not the main bowler, you can be the side bowler, like the 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 Robin to his Batman kind of thing, uh, the the Scotty Pippen to his Michael Jordan, and you can be ex- like someone like Trent Bolt is obviously overqualified for that kind of role. Um, maybe that's pure and simply the difference, and we just need to make sure he's got he's well stocked beside him. I mean. Our best white ball bowler over the last two to three years has been Lockie Ferguson. So Lockie Ferguson also didn't play a whole lot. Um, and when he did, he took a bundle of wickets against the West Indies over the last summer because of injuries. So maybe that's also a factor. I don't know. There's an interesting thing to see there that both Jamison and Bolt did. Um, and I haven't got Jamis, uh, Bolt's summer stats behind me. So he might have done better than I have the impression. But um, Bolt hasn't always been as effective in 2020s as he has been in the other formats where we know if he's, you know, arguably the second name of the team sheet and in, in tests and um, tests and ODIs and Jamison also doing well at the IPL when he hadn't done that well for the poor. That is, there's maybe some, there's maybe some kind of story in that. I don't know, but um, mostly I'm just, yeah, as you say, paralleling that with Will Young's um, hundred over the, you know, last week, like that's, this, these are good things. <laughs> these are players who are involved in the test squad. These are good things to see. If you're taking, like, I think um, uh, abilities, uh, to throw out my guptal syndrome idea, um, abilities don't always translate across formats. That's something that people don't always take into consideration. However, I think form does. Like, uh, I reckon if you're if you're taking wickets in 2020, you're feeling confident. Um, it is a different beast to, to go into a test series. But I think if you're, if you've got that confidence up, you're feeling like the ball's coming out well, I, I think the form generally translates fairly well. Depends on who it is as well. Yeah, well, it does. If you're Martin Guptill scoring bundles of 2020 runs and coming to test matches and struggling, yeah, that was a, that was the impetus of the entire Guptill syndrome full stop. But yeah, so, so someone like Bolt who's... um experienced in all formats, I don't think yeah, it's a drama yeah. there. Um, also interesting, like we're... So we've got the IPL presenting us, pushing us into Test cricket. Also need to store back in, in the back of our minds some T20 World Cup stuff if they find a way to have a T20 World Cup. Cole Jamison with the bat. Only 59 runs. 
but he scored those 59 runs at a strike rate of 143, which is definitely higher than Kane Williamson and was the 30th highest strike rate not with no minimum of runs scored. So there's a lot of like weird strike rates in there. But Kyle Jamison did score 59 runs of 41 deliveries, which when forecasting forward to a Black Caps T20 team, depending on where Kyle Jamison's T20 bowling goes, good IPL, bad series versus Australia, and kind of just bad international T20. He's got four wickets and an average of 70. So he's got some work to do to guarantee that spot in the T20 lineup. But he does, if we're looking for a number seven, number eight, I think Kyle Jamison is a decent candidate because he hits runs off not many balls. And that's exactly what you want down the order. Any other cricketing notes you want to share, Wildcard? Um, well, I haven't used these stats yet, but I have mentioned them on, on other podcasts where, um, where's the bloody thing coming up? Um, the average of like amount of deliveries that you face as a number seven batsman is about eight. So as a number eight, it's six. Um, that's your average 2020 international innings uh, for like those parts of the batting order so someone like Kyle Jamison like just to reinforce what you're saying that is literally perfect like if you can come in hit pretty much from ball one um in a short amount of time you're not going to get time to bat yourself in so that's not an option so if you can score like it it's just because what Jamison did he didn't score a 50 or anything like that did he he just tallied up little cameos of like um 10 off six or you know 15 off um 11 or those kind of little innings those are so valuable like that's exactly what you want to be able to have from your guy in that situation of the batting lineup and it's arguably something that the black caps it's it's not a major weakness in the team but it's maybe a, a factor that could be improved upon um Mitchell Santner bats there a lot and he is not necessarily one who's coming out hitting boundaries from ball one when he when he catches them, they go a long way. Like it's, he can time a ball extremely well. He doesn't necessarily turn the strike over well enough and um, and hit boundaries nice and quickly well enough um, from the very start. And he's not the only one who's been in that situation either. So that's that is definitely like I don't know if it's an underrated aspect of Jamison's career because people have been talking him up as a potential all rounder since he got into the Test team. Um, which is something you got to be very, very careful about because they said that about Tim Sally once upon a time too. But yeah, that's a a big factor of his game. Like he's he's not just a bowler; he will score some nice runs down the end. So that's sweet as. Um, I I don't know I don't know where else to go with um with cricket. So I did I I saw Devin Conway's popping up in the twenty twenty stuff in England. Is that like just over the last day or so? That's right, eh? Yeah, but so he's the only one who's going to play county cricket as well after. Ah, right. Oh, well, good so for him. So he signed a deal with Somerset that is T20, and I think he's playing two um, county games for Somerset as well. Just going wait. So just to finish, that, that strike rate thing and balls faced, I assume that as you go from 1 to 11 in the batting lineup, the balls face gradually decreases, correct? Yeah, um, and not just the ball's face, but the chances of you batting. Because when I say the average number, what did I say? The average number eight faces 6.21 deliveries. This is based on 2020 and in, in international 2020s, the year of 2020. Um, the other aspect is that the average number eight bats 56.8% of the time. So like 43% of the time you don't bat at all. And those 43% of the time that you do bat, which is less than half of the games, that's how often you that's how many balls you get to face. So if I would imagine that the ideal scenario is that you want like if you if if you have if you've got the similar team for a decent statistical period of time, you want strike rates that increase as the balls face decrease. So yeah, of course you want strike rates, high strike rates in T20 cricket throughout the top order, the first five batsmen, first six batsmen. But then as 
deliveries decrease, you want to up that strike rate. So you, if your if your average is four deliveries, regardless of the percentage that you actually bet, maybe that makes it more. But if your if your average is three deliveries in that spot, your strike rate should be higher than the dude betting before you whose average is five deliveries. That's the ideal scenario is that as balls face decreases, strike rate increases, and basically you just want your bowlers to be able to access the boundary. Pretty much, yeah. I think that adds up pretty pretty ideally. Like, cause the the reason you bat with a lower strike rate up the top is because you it's risk versus reward and that kind of thing like you don't want to lose heaps of wickets early on and expose the batsmen who aren't used to batting longer times like you want to occupy the crease um all these kind of things so you do sort of expect sometimes you get like the the opening batsman who just comes out and goes ballistic as a deliberate sort of strategy a lot of teams do that sweet as um someone coming in at three generally probably would be like your anchor for the rest of the innings, ideally he's going to bat at least 10 overs and get the team through to where your number eight only needs to face six deliveries or whatever. And then when they come in, yeah, like if you're only going to face six deliveries, there's no point batting dot balls. Like if you if you hit it, just run. And if you hit it, hit it hard and hope you get more than one. Um, hit some fours and sixes. Like if you're going to come in and face three deliveries as a as a number, I don't know, nine or 10 or something, I would be hoping you can hit one of those three boundaries, like one of those three balls to the boundary. That's pretty much the aim at that point. At face three balls, you hit one boundary, you'd guarantee a strike rate above 100. Batting 100 to parlay the betting 1,000 baseball reference. You're betting, betting 100. What are, you, what are you up to? I'm betting 100. 100 strike rate. Yeah, right. Righto. Maybe an RPO less than, less than seven as well in T20 cricket, but... Usually, usually we want the jokers who are three point five RPO and a good two day, good two day or four day. They seem like more our type of cat. Yeah, or Colin Munro coming in in a test match with a RPO of like one point two or something like that. <laughs> Jacob Warham used to do that back in the day as well. New Zealand's always got a hard hitting all rounder who can just dot up maidens, who also definitely bat a hundred. Yes, yes, for sure. There we go. There we go. Right. Another episode of the Nishcast Done and Dusted. We'll be back early in the week for the variety show. Email coming out Friday, tomorrow. Plenty of good stuff on the niche-cage.com. Kia kaha. Stay beautiful. Cha-cha.